I'm your host, Christian Black, and welcome to our first Danish miniseries episode, The Warden's Daughter. A story begins with Anne, a criminology professor for the Danish Institute for Study Abroad program at Copenhagen. I got connected to Anne during my time abroad and how she taught other American students interested in studying criminology through Danish prisons. Her lectures, tours, and any other way that she could connect us to their world was remarkable. But the real thing that was unique about Anne was her background. She spent the majority of her childhood coexisting with inmates on a farm. But before I can dive into Anne's story, I want to talk a little bit about Denmark itself. To get a picture of the size of Denmark, the state of California is about nine times larger than the country itself. Los Angeles is only about two million people shy from matching the entire population. However, in this little country, you can expect a lot of big things. One is free healthcare, free education, and a community that's so trusting you can see parents leaving their newborns outside while they go inside a busy cafe to get a cup of coffee so they don't disturb the sleeping child. Hoogly, or a cozy collective mindset, is a very common phrase inside Danish society, and it's very common inside their prison system as well. It emulates normal life while behind bars. In a nutshell, inmates are able to cook their own meals, wear their own clothes, and they can even vote while they're behind bars. So naturally, I wanted to interview Anne and go into detail on her experience neighboring with inmates. So I was able to connect with her and interview her by recording her on my phone. But first, before she could tell her story, we had to talk about her dad. With your experiences as, you know, growing up with your father, being a warden, what was that like? What was the facility like? What kind of facility was it? And also, what was your father's opinion on the penal system then, um, and even the inmates that resided there? Mm-hmm. Um, I'd say that uh, I, th- I think it's uh, it's worth going back a little bit in time. My father, uh, my father's interest in the prison service started already with, when he was. Uh, it wasn't so much in uh, an interest in the prison service when he was a child. But uh, they had lots of vagrants coming by his home uh, that they uh, that they helped, uh, and and he found uh, an interest in in the population of people who were not uh, doing that well in society. He he enjoyed talking to them. His his mother used to uh, give them uh, food uh, and give them uh, something to do. So they would, for instance. Uh, I don't know whether they wash windows, but at least they would sharpen knives and stuff like that. And then they, she would take their tobacco and their uh, matches uh, before she let them sleep uh, in the um, do you call that in in the in the in the barn where where the hay was. So she would she would always take the tobacco and and their um, uh, and their matches uh, because uh, if not, uh, a lot of them would not have the, what should I say, um, the awareness of um, fire uh, mm-hmm. risks and, and so on. Uh, and they were very often people who were alcoholics uh, and who were kind of a little bit outcast from society. And, and my father liked talking to them and he liked, he liked them and he would like to work with a population like that. And that made him uh, go for uh, the prison system. Uh, he studied law and um, at some point, either while he was a student of law, I think it was, uh, bef- no, it was probably before he became a student of law, he was, um, he had a, a volunteer uh, position with a, a, a prison that was uh, nearby where he lived. Uh, it was a kind of a youth prison, I think, at the time. And uh, he was quite fascinated with the people who worked, uh, who, were, who lived there as uh, prisoners. And they were also fascinating to him because at that point in time, Denmark had just been occupied for six years by the Germans during the Second World War. My father was born in 1930. So he was 15 when the, um, uh, when the, um, 
he was 15 when the war ended and he has been somewhere like 16, uh, 17 when he really started to understand about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, he was also part of a family uh, that was not doing too well. His father died uh, in 38, mm -hmm. uh, meaning that uh, my father's older brothers and the mother had to try make the farm um, kind of uh, subsist, they make, make, make things work and they were not too good at that. And then also my father's brothers, uh, who were probably in the early 20s, they were part of the resistance movement in Denmark. And that meant that, of course, they were very scared during the war because uh, they were very scared that uh, they would be found out and they, they would be sent to a concentration camp, mm -hmm. even if one did not fully understand how bad the concentration camps were. But when my father uh, was a volunteer uh, at, that, at that prison, I think uh, th that working there must have been really key for him uh, in his uh, in his later uh, engagement with the prison service because on the one hand he really hated some of the people who were there or at least he, I think he wouldn't use the word hate but he would say that uh, he was cold towards some of the that, that that was kind of as strong as his language would get because there he would be standing in front of the people who had been working with the Germans either they had been supporting the Germans through working with them or they were people who had been turning in uh, people like his brothers so they would have sent people to concentration camps and uh, on the one hand, he was had a very cold demeanor uh, to, uh, towards him. On the other hand, he understood that he had to be professional. And he had understood from the Holocaust and from living in a... Um, he was in a dorm with uh, people who were from families of resistance movie, movement uh, people, some people who had been in the resistance movement themselves, some people who had been to concentration camps. And in that dorm, they would hear the screams of the people who had nightmares from the concentration camps. And that meant that my dad somehow got an understanding on the one hand of uh, how terrible it is to be in prison mm -hmm. and how prison or imprisonment is detrimental to everyone who is in it, uh, how it is necessary that we treat people well in prison. And on the other hand, he would have, have this need also for, for punishment in relation to those people who were in uh, in Kersugor, as, as it was called that place. And later he uh, he also, uh, yeah, and then he, he, he uh, strived to really get into the prison service. You had to get uh, especially high grades and he didn't get that at first. So he had to redo some, it was possible at the time to redo some exams in order to get into, uh, to get the high grades so that he could get into the prison service. And that's then where he uh, started in the mid to late 50s, he, he really started in the prison service. Mm -hmm. As far as I understood at some, time, at some point, I don't really have documentation for it, but I, as far as I understood, he um, also worked with some people who had themselves been to prison during the war. Mm -hmm. And uh, having been to prison uh, is something, uh, people having uh, actually tried to be imprisoned, uh, people who later got into positions of power in Denmark, I think that's something that has been crucial to the development in our prison service since. Wow. Just like, you know, the, the knowledge that we have from Milgram is something that has really influenced uh, a lot of people. Um, and I'd say it's probably the same for Norway, uh, whereas Sweden was not, uh, they were supposedly neutral during the war. Mm. Um, and in that way, you know, he, working for humane prison conditions is, is something that was deeply rooted uh, in my dad. And that meant that when I grew up in uh, prison, he was, you know, he was working in a system that was much, much better or getting much better than it had originally been. And at the same time, there was really a lot to work on. And I think that uh, the things that there were most of all to, uh, to work on were first, uh, you know, um, normalization of uh, legal rules uh, so that uh, prisoners had the rights that everybody in society uh, had. It was not until the uh, 70s that uh, inmates in Denmark gained those rights. I'm not totally sure what what uh, rights were lacking but i do know that that one had to work to to introduce the uh, the rule that everybody had the right to follow the news 
uh, everybody had the right to know the content of rule collections, stuff like that. Which is, of course, you know, if you don't know the rule collections, how, how on earth can you behave in a prison? That's really impossible. But in the 70s, we got uh, those uh, rights uh, in place for, uh, for inmates, uh, mostly. And then he continued, of course, to work on to make uh, prisons better in relation also, I'd say, to resocialization, but in the way that resocialization should be something that was a possibility for you. Mm -hmm. I think that he was also part of a generation that would not, they wouldn't believe that uh, you can take a person and then you can just resocialize him. Mm -hmm. You know, people have their own minds and some people need to take their time until they uh, want to uh, leave crime. But he, he he's originally started in a system that was extremely authoritarian, a very military-like, and he ended up, uh, when he left the service, uh, it was a system that had turned um, very much in, in another direction. Um, already in around 1993, uh, he left the service in uh, 2000. Already in 1993, they introduced kitchens in the, uh, mm -hmm. in the prisons, uh, kitchens where you could, uh, what should I say, where you could cook your own food. Um, and they would, they would also, you know, they had for a long time had their own clothes and, and so on. But they started having self-administration then, where you have your own, you cook your own food, uh, you wash your own clothes and, and stuff like that. And that's, uh, that's something that he was part of introducing. He was uh, sometimes worried about uh, changes like that because he worried that the weakest prisoners would not get something to eat. Mm. Uh, which has mostly not been a problem, uh, but it, it does happen, of course. But then the staff mm -hmm. can can get them some something else that they can, uh, if they use all their money and somehow do not get along with the other prisoners in the way that they can do the dishes for them or something like that. Right, right. For the the food groups that have been introduced mm. by um, Professor Linda. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, and, and they make food groups together in, in the prisons in general, yeah. uh, depending on their taste and who they like, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. All right, so before we move on, I wanted to say something real quick about food groups. Now, Linda is another professor I met during my time in Denmark, and really my main connection to Anne. She's a researcher that works with inmates and also teaches the importance of community dining and maintaining interpersonal relationships while serving time. Earlier, Anne mentioned how inmates are able to cook their own meals and even shop for their own food while in prison. Well, in order to save money and to have more fulfilling meals, inmates usually form food groups. They split the grocery lists and, like a little mini potluck, they come together. Most Danish institutions find this super helpful since it reduces internal conflicts. However, even this has some drawbacks, but that's a whole nother story. Let's get back to Anne. What would you say inside of that, that prison ward by your father's experiences or even your own experiences, the prison conditions there before the certain transformation of allowing these inmates to cook their own meals and you know wear their own clothes and do their own laundry, and then even at the tail end afterwards, that transformation, was it a shock for, for him or for you, and how did the rest of the staff feel about it and how did the inmates react to it as well? I'd say that uh, if uh, I, I don't know so much about the inmates because in 1993 I, was, uh, I had already moved uh, away from home. I was 23 at the time, so I hadn't been at, uh, living at the prison for five years uh, at that time. And also, I mostly had to do with inmates when I was a little kid, mm -hmm. because uh, inmates were so happy to see a little kid, uh, especially uh, because, you know, they were in such, there were just adults around. It was very, uh, a culture, uh, the prison culture is very machismo-ish, at least in a male prison. Um, so they were happy to, to see a kid. At the same time, they were very uh, much taking care that uh, nobody would uh, see them talking to me and misunderstanding mm -hmm. the way that they were talking to me. My brother has uh, told me here uh, after our father died that, uh, that there were times that apparently he, he would tell my mother that there could be all kinds of, uh, of uh, people with all kinds of sentences in the prison, but he didn't always tell apparently our mother that sometimes there would also be people with uh, sentences for uh, child abuse or pedophilia 
who were actually working pretty close to to the house because he didn't want to uh, to worry him. But so so we would be actually playing around freely, and uh, as long as my mother knew that I was at the other end of the garden, we had a very very it was. A, a big garden, a really, really big garden. Uh, if we imagine a whole, uh, that there's a row of trees and then there's a whole room at the other side, then a room that was bigger than this one would be our kitchen garden, we call it, where we had our uh, greenery, with all the uh, salad and um, um, strawberries and, and what do you call that? Well, a garden or just where you grow your vegetables, fruits yes. and vegetables, yeah. Yeah, the vegetable <laughs> garden, uh, that was there. So I could easily be out of sight from from my mother, but but she would know where I was. She, she stayed at home, mm. um, and it was not something that uh, seemed to worry them particularly. Uh, but on the other hand, they uh, I was never allowed. My brother could be allowed to uh, to stay at home uh, at night alone, and I could not. Mm. And I didn't really realize that until I was eighteen, when at uh, one point neither my mother nor my father could be at home. And they uh, they insisted that I had a friend stay with me mm -hmm. because, as they said, uh, inmates don't have a lot to do, mm -hmm. uh, and they will notice. Uh, they will know if we are not home and you are home alone. They will know, and we don't want to take that risk. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so in a way, that there were things that they were definitely careful about. My brother was also allowed to go for a run uh, in the woods uh, of the uh, prison. He just had to tell headquarters that now he was going for a run in the woods and uh, they would that would be totally okay. I was only allowed to run where or to go for a run uh, where there were lights uh, on the street. Mm. Uh, so, so there were some things that they were looking out for, uh, definitely. But I didn't talk that much to, uh, to inmates also because um, uh, in, in some way, uh, because I was uh, told to uh, to respect them mm. and to not uh, bother them, mm. and in some ways because I was shy, and and they were adults, and as a kid, uh, especially when when I was uh, getting above ten or something like that, I, I didn't feel like talking to to people I didn't know well. So so I don't really know so much about what they uh, what they thought about necessar that, uh, necessarily necessarily. And then especially a lot of the changes uh, that happened with uh, self-administration that changed after I had uh, left home. Mm. Uh, I think there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of uh, resistance in the, um, in, among staff, but that also had to do with the self-administration reform that came at the same time as a uh, reform of the prison officer role. Before they had just been turnkeys, and now they were also to be doing casework they were to do more spare time activities with the uh, inmates uh, and they were, uh, during a certain time, they were also supposed to be working as work foremen some of the time and that very quickly stopped because that was, that was a mess. But there was something that they had gotten in return for a race and there was a lot of debate as to, well, there were of course people saying we should have the race no matter what, uh, we don't have to do more work and, and so on. And some people really had trouble adjusting to doing the casework. Mm -hmm. uh, because they might, a lot of them would have gone into the job with the uh, intention of not doing something bookish. Mm -hmm. um, and this was also the time where computers came into the presence and so on. So it was a big, bit of a, a revolution uh, that happened those years. Wow. So during our discussion, Anne remembered a video that an inmate made on the same prison grounds that she grew up on. She was able to show me some and she remembered what it was like when she was young. When, uh, when I was a kid, I was kind of a timid kid and the, the kind of kid that, uh, you know, if people looked at me, I would start crying, that kind of kid. So uh, sometimes I was bullied a little bit and uh, sometimes some, some uh, boys would be chasing me and, and then sometimes some of the inmates would shout at them. So I very much felt like the, the inmates were my protectors yeah. uh, in a lot of ways. Which is with a guy, it's a video that's actually from uh, that prison. Oh, wow. Yes, there it is. Uh, this video is, uh, it's part of a... Um, and this is inside the prison ward itself? Yes, this mm -hmm. is, uh, this is a, a guy who is uh, in uh, prison mm -hmm. uh, and who is talking to the camera about how he feels about being in prison. And he's saying that uh, right now I'm trying to find out about how to get a job. 
You know, that's the bed that you're uh, sleeping on, and it's the kind of bed that you can roll your, uh, you can roll in your, um, uh, your bedding, so it can hide in in this one. Mm. Uh, and then you'll see, in the, this is his uh, fridge, his own fridge that he has uh, in the prison. He has some pictures also, and you'll see, uh, he has a telephone which is tied to the wall uh, with a wire so that he can text uh, but he can, and he can call, but he cannot uh, do anything else. And you'll see his TV in uh, just a moment. Mm. And he talks about he's annoyed with his municipality that they don't want to help him. Mm. And he's really trying to find something positive, but... Uh, uh, feeling really bad at the same time. I'll try to get the best out of it while I'm here. Mm. And that's a, a, a flat screen TV because the flat screen TVs are easier to search. So the prison provides those mm -hmm. uh, rather than people having to, uh, to be um, uh, using. Yeah, and now he's going outside, which is uh, I find interesting. He's going outside and he's uh, going to uh, show how easy it is to leave the prison. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's going down to actually the stream that I mentioned before. Uh, I'm going to uh, show you a place that we're going to. I'm not sure I really uh, am allowed to go there, but now I'm going to do it. Let's see what uh, he's saying. And, and he says, I can, I can go here, and then I can see right on the other street there's a road, and I could just go there. Uh, and I'm standing there sometimes thinking about it. So he goes down to the stream, place where a lot of people fish. Um, but not at the prison, because they're not allowed to, because the fishing rights belong to another club. Uh. But they could if they had the fishing rights. So that's the stream. And you know I know exactly where this place is because I would go there sometimes as a child. Then he says, over there, that's the road. You can you can see a house, the house over there. So there's a stream here and then the house is over there and that's a bus uh, goes by. Wow. But at the time where, uh, where I lived there, uh, the bus would actually go through the prison. Hmm. And uh, it was the uh, bus company that stopped that. It was not the prison. They, they found it to be okay. Hmm. He, he says, uh, I, could, I could walk off if I liked. They wouldn't even notice, uh, not until they are doing the rounds uh, later today. They wouldn't even know. And he talks a little bit about his frustration, and then he walks back to the vault. Wow. På vej tilbage til afdelingen, hvor Rick her accepterer, at han skal sidde her et halvt år mere, før han bliver løslet efter fuld tid. And they say that uh, he, is, uh, he has to accept now that he uh, has to stay for six months more, because he cannot get parole, uh, because of some of his behavior, and he's very frustrated because he has six months, months more. But you know, if you show that to an American in there... Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I wish I had six months like that, yes. Yeah. yeah. And this is the only, you could say, really perimeter security that there is. Well, so that gives you kind of a picture. An of it, idea, right? yeah. A better picture, at least, than, mm -hmm. than so many others. Yeah. Your brother, um, on the other hand, so is he your older brother? Yes, he is okay. four and a half years older than me. Oh, okay. So would you say that he engaged more with the inmates more, or were you both... Just make sure you don't bother them. Uh, yeah, we yeah. were very much like that, both of us. I see. I think that maybe at the first prison that uh, we lived at, that was the one that my father had volunteered at when he was younger, he would probably have had a bit more to do with the, the inmates. It was a very, very hugely prison at the uh -huh. time. It is, it's not anymore because now it's an extradition center for people who have not committed crime. Some people who have committed crime and who are extradited and people who have not committed crime but who are also to be extradited and they are put, you know, in this place in far off uh, Jutland and uh, where they can hardly uh, get out of the place and there, uh, there are no shops and there is no nothing. Uh, and that's, that's become a really nasty place uh, mm. today. But at the time it was very hugely and was a place with uh, lots of uh, uh, fields because it was also a farm. And was actually where I committed my first crime. Oh, really? Was my brother who lured me into it mm -hmm. uh, because uh, my brother convinced me that it was not a problem if we took one of the sugar beets 
and uh, ate some of it. So mm-hmm. I I distinctly remember having some of that sugar beet uh, beetroot mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, being very much uh, conflicted because on the one hand my brother said that I could do it, on the other hand it was the prison's uh, property, mm-hmm. and I I felt really really uh, strongly about that. There was something wrong with with eating the prison's property. Mm. Right. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> So I had to ask, what was it like in Denmark post-incarceration? You hear so many stories in the United States on how difficult it is to get a job and even support yourself after you have a criminal record. How does the public view you? Is there a stigma? What Anne had to say definitely exposed Denmark's challenges on it. After, you know, being released from that prison ward rehabilitation Mm -hmm. and being able to reintegrate back into society, was it easier back then or um, did the inmates ever have any trouble doing that? Oh, lots of trouble. Mm -hmm. There there are definitely, uh, you you know, in the US, uh, there is this thing about ticking the box. Mm-hmm. Um, in Denmark, we don't we don't have that kind of box on our uh, applications uh, at all. Oh. We, we don't have a box, but what we do have in, is, in a way, something that's a little bit harsher. Um, well, the, the harsh thing, of course, also about uh, the box in, in the US is that it's about whether one has ever committed a felony, which is really rough. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the other hand, you can lie. Mm with that box. Mm-hmm. You can't lie in Denmark because in Denmark what happens is that for uh, that you get your uh, you go to the police and you uh, ask for a uh, your criminal record and they will print out your criminal record uh, for you or you get it uh, you would get it digitally uh, today. And in some cases what happens uh, is that uh, you don't do that part yourself. Mm-hmm. It is uh, the um, the uh, place that your the the potential employer who contacts the uh, the criminal registry, and then they get your accept to give them mm-hmm. the criminal record, and mm-hmm. that means that you there is no way that you can falsify it or something. Of, of course, you, people most people would not falsify, but but it's not possible to get out of that. Right. So in that way, uh, the, and that criminal registry. Uh, if it is what's called the private um, registry, that is for private companies and so on, uh, then it, uh, you have sentences that uh, you have been released from or where your probationary time has ended uh, within the last two to five years, depending on the kind of, uh, of uh, crime. Uh, but if it's for a public office, uh, not just a public office, but anything that, that is, uh, for instance, uh, owned by the the public uh, sector, Mm -hmm. like a uh, nursing home or something like that, then it goes back 10 years, Mm -hmm. which is actually uh, quite a bit. Um, So that means that in a way we are more restrictive since uh, you cannot just, you know, um, not tick the box. Right. Uh, There's no possibility for that. And then something that has made things a lot uh, more difficult uh, for people in recent years is that um, we have we uh, have people uh, paying court fees. We don't have public defenders. Mm-hmm. The good thing is that you can uh, you can choose any uh, lawyer. So you can get a good lawyer at least if uh, the lawyer accepts you and you know who to contact. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, you have to pay uh, if you uh, do not get uh, acquitted, then you have to pay uh, the fees of the lawyer when you get out of prison. Oh, wow. So you can easily get, uh, for, if you're lucky, you only get 50,000 kroner to pay, but I met lots of people who have to pay 400,000 or 800,000 or 2 million kroner or something like that. Wow. And that's then something that has been ga- gaining interest while you were in prison. And then, you know, you might never really get the possibility to pay it back. And that's something that uh, has some really harsh consequences for people and something which actually what also makes it tough is that um, in Denmark, the uh, IRS, sorry, they can will, will hold your pay. Oh, wow. Um, and they generally go directly into your pay to take out your, uh, to take, uh, your taxes out of your wages. But they can also go in directly and take uh, any debt that you have to the public sector. So that means that you don't even get to see the money. They cut you down directly, and that's whether you are uh, earning money or whether you are on social services. And that means that as a uh, released prisoner with debt, you have no interest in getting a job because 
you will be in the same bad situation whether you are whether you have a job or whether you are on social security mm. and then also something that the irs can do is that they can go out and have a look at your possessions uh, and then they can confiscate those if you seem to not have been telling them about the money that you earn mm, wow and that means that you have an incentive to have a fake home a fake address and you have an incentive to have jobs uh, that are not registered and that means that you have <laughs> an incentive to live in crime right which is really uh, not very good yeah not good at all mm. yeah and i'm pretty sure at sometimes it could be misleading as well oh yes yes oh wow so when it if you have to compare like the penal system back to you know when your father was volunteering for that and working into that and even your own experiences working mm -hmm. inside the penal system and then to today how would you say that that has sort of shifted um has it been for the greater good has it um had some good or bad things that's been added to it i'm familiar with how as you said previously, inmates are now able to cook their own meals and have, mm. you know, their own clothing and things like that. However, um, has there been any negative things that's happened? Because especially politically wise, uh, with the immigration influx, mm. I'm familiar with that. Um, the prison population, most more, you know, people of Arab background has been filling Danish prisons. So what would you say is your take on that? Well, I'd say that if we go back so far that we're thinking about when my father started in the system, then there is actually something else that I'd rather point to as a big change in society and in prisons. And that is the change in uh, the view of authority mm. that came with uh, 1968 and with the youth revolt. Um, Back in those days, you know, people would be very well behaved when we compare to, to today. And uh, the decline uh, in respect of authority is, of course, something that has impacted the prisons uh, a lot, both in relation to who gets uh, to prison and what do people get to prison for, um, and how they behave in prison. Um, and that means that uh, prison today is a totally different thing. It is also a place where, in a lot of ways, um, I'd say something that's different compared to the US is that the way that Danish society has developed, uh, as a Dane, you generally uh, expect to be respected as a human being. Mm. And that's something that's a really tough for people when they get to prison, mm. because they don't feel necessarily respected as human beings. Uh, at the same time, uh, the prison system is so, is, is in an extreme way, more respectful of the individual, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily what you uh, what you experience. And I think that a pretty good example uh, comes from one of the visits that I had to Europe uh, with uh, my students. Um, a very uh, intelligent uh, young man uh, asked uh, the prisoner that was our guide uh, a question that to him was totally logical and that made absolutely no sense to the inmate. Uh, and that question was, do you feel uh, do you feel grateful that you have the right to vote? Mm. And for the inmate, he looked at me and said, "What what, uh, mm -hmm. what what is he talking about?" And then I had to explain that in the U.S. you you uh, lose the right lose to vote it. and so on. And he was just like he, he he couldn't relate to the question at all. Mm -hmm. He didn't you know, but he didn't even get uh, he didn't get, feel insulted. Mm -hmm. But it was a little bit like asking a woman or asking a black person, are you grateful that you have the right to vote? Right. It was a little bit the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, because it was really the question, are you grateful that you're regarded as a human being? Right. Um, and uh, I think that um, it demonstrates some of the change that has happened with the Dan Danish prisons, but it also demonstrates uh, some of the, um, some of the uh, differences between American and Danish society, because in the US, well, at least the students that I meet, they expect that you would feel degraded as a human being. Uh, and, and, well, not just feel, because you will feel degraded in Denmark as well, but, but that you would feel, um, what should I say, that you would feel that it was right to mm -hmm. degrade you or something like that. I don't expect that inmates find that it's, uh, American inmates find it to be right. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, there is different thinking about that uh, in, in, 
in so many ways. Does right. that make sense? Yes, absolutely. So even stemming off of that, is there to the general public, general Danish public, how would you say that the stigma of being inside prison is handled because I know that there's a huge stigma inside the mm. United States, not only trying to get housing or a job or, you know, what have you, mm. but even engaging inside your everyday life and family members or close friends who know that you've been to prison treat you differently inside the States. How is it here in Denmark? Uh, well, uh, I, I'd say that Denmark has become a lot more punitive in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. Uh, if I look back uh, 10 or 20 years, especially 20 years, then if I talk to people about crime, they would uh, first be a little bit uh, like, mm -hmm. you know, why do people commit crime? And then very quickly they would get to, uh, well, prison doesn't make anyone better. Mm -hmm. That would be very, very uh, fast a conclusion uh, from them. Mm -hmm. Today, it would uh, the, the uh, people might not even get to that point, and a lot of people will be saying stuff like, "So, do they learn? Do they learn something from it?" Mm -hmm. Which is baffling to me because what the heck are you supposed to learn from going to, right. to prison? Uh, but Denmark has become much more punitive, and that means that I think that you are judged more today than you would have been 20 years ago, where there was more of a thinking in society that crime happened uh, due to social circumstances. Mm. Um, so I think there's a lot more, uh, on the one hand, there is a lot more uh, people, a lot more judgmental and punitive. On the other hand, there is also a certain tendency to make uh, some people who have committed crime into celebs which is a really strange uh, thing to, to see. Mm -hmm. so, so there are, you know, things are going in, in, uh, in more directions. And then there's also a tendency uh, in some parts of public debate to equal crime uh, with immigrants or descendants of immigrants, mm -hmm. uh, which is ridiculous if you uh, really, if you look at the, uh, people very often misunderstand statistics. So when they hear that there is an overrepresentation of people uh, of, of a crime committed uh, with uh, among the immigrant descendant population, then they start thinking that most crime in Denmark is committed by immigrants and descendants, mm -hmm. but it's not. Most is committed by Danes, mm -hmm. but uh, people are very very confused about that because they don't understand the statistics that follow with overrepresentation. Right, right. So you would say that the general public, because of those statistics and since they aren't able to navigate it or aren't able to fully comprehend it, they feel that, you know, people of Arab background or immigrants commit most of the crimes. However, it's usually Danes that commit most of the crime um, here inside Denmark. However, there hasn't been any, you know, movement or representative or individual who sort of lifted the veil off of this sort of fallacy. Well, there are a lot of uh, researchers who have been doing that, but it, they have been uh, getting less and less uh, attention in uh, the press. There's especially uh, one criminologist in Denmark who's called Fleming Bellamy, who has, uh, who has uh, done a lot. But even when he was working the hardest in the 90s, even then a lot of people were rejecting what he said because some of what he talked about was how we have less crime, less violence in Denmark than we used to have. If we go back to the 50s, one would have a lot more violence in society. And because, well, people don't understand that, yes, it is a much less violent society. Also, violence is criminalized in a way that it wasn't. There is this tendency to reject knowledge because it doesn't, uh, what should I say, um, it doesn't um, um, what, uh, confirm people's feelings or their thoughts about uh, themselves or their own identity. Mm. Um, but when I was, uh, when I, in, in the 80s, when I was a teenager, there would very often, that we, I lived in, in it was a rural uh, area I, mm. I, I came from, and uh, the most uh, drinking would happen in relation to balls uh, at the inn. Um, it was very common there that uh, people got into a fight 
and then the uh, local cop would come by and, and he would uh, separate uh, the two uh, or the number of people who were fighting mm -hmm. and then he would uh, scold them and then he would say, uh, shake hands and go home and sleep it off. Mm -hmm. But today, uh, the people who were in that fight would, uh, would get a... Um, uh, they would both be reported uh, mm -hmm. for violence and they might get a sentence. And that makes for a very, very different situation. There was yeah. also, you know, violence against children is completely outlawed today. Uh, also for parents, you're not allowed to hit your child in Denmark at all. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not how it was when I wa was a kid. I wasn't... <laughs> Uh, my, my mother really laughed at, at the story regarding my brother. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in this very rural community and it means there was a lot of people who came from uh, farms and uh, some, some of the families, not all of the families of course, but some of the families were a bit rough. Um, and that means that uh, in my brother's school class there would, be, there would be a number of people who were beaten at home. And at one point, the uh, school teacher uh, is uh, kind of uh, trying to talk to the kids about violence, and uh, and she or he uh, asks uh, whether anyone has been beaten at home. Mm -hmm. And my brother lifts uh, the hand, and and the teacher was apparently very surprised because the the nice, uh, really respectable prison warden's mm -hmm. uh, boy was raising his hand, and then my brother said, "Yes, my mother hit me because I tried to uh, uh, to touch the hot stove, and then she she kind of hit uh, my hand <laughs> away, and she just lost." <laughs> <laughs> the others, you know, they were blue and yellow and, and so on, mm -hmm. but, but, uh, but, but there's really a lot of, of violence that has luckily disappeared. Mm. There's a lot of uh, common drinking that has disappeared, but it's not something that people are really that attentive to. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of the knowledge that we have that is kind of pushed away. And there's very, uh, especially in the last 10 years, um, there's been this kind of right-wing blogosphere that has kind of moved into... Uh, the mainstream media, mm -hmm. and that is very visible that way, mm -hmm. generating a lot of clicks. Yes, yeah, I would assume that because of this certain, I've only, uh, if, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I'm not too familiar with Danish politics too much, only mm -hmm. what I've read, but I've heard that there is a huge shift when it comes to just being uh, a right extremist here mm -hmm. in Denmark. Yeah, the Danish People's Party yeah. used to be seen as extremists, and they mm -hmm. are definitely not anymore. Yes. Back in the 90s, there was this uh, social democratic uh, prime minister who uh, said to, to the Danish People's Party, you are never going to be, what would you say, what is it they call a dog that has been, you are no, never going to be house trained. Mm -hmm. But in Danish, the word would be, you are, you are never going to be... Um, uh, sufficiently clean for being in the living room mm -hmm. um, and um, and they have been in the living room for a long time now mm -hmm. and sitting at the high table. Wow, wow. So how would you say that the current Danish politics right now and people who are in power and how it's shifting now is affecting the sort of how the prisons are ran here in Denmark? It is, uh, well, the whole way of thinking has become a lot more punitive and I have to say since the refugee crisis a couple of years ago when when we had our caravan mm -hmm. uh, walking up uh, the the highways of, of, uh, of Europe and mm -hmm. also of Denmark since then it, it, it seemed like it really created a total shift in European politics where a lot of people became really scared um, and felt that we were going to be overtaken or something like that by uh, refugees and uh, with that has come both uh, more hostility towards uh, immigrants. There has uh, been there has become a lot more focus on uh, race, also in a lot of ways on race in the in the way that wasn't before. Um, people are talking more about white people versus non-white people, and uh, the, because of the thinking regarding uh, what uh, what uh, the crime level is like in in the different groups of the population there is yes it's it's becoming much for, there are some things that are coming becoming better about prisons and the is, the thing that is come, becoming really a lot better is that there are a lot of people that we don't put to prison today mm. we put them in community sanctions or we put them in electronic monitoring but that means that the prisons uh, prison population has become tougher Mm. Uh, because it's only the people who cannot be in those, uh, who have very long sentences or who cannot be in the alternatives, it's only those people who go to prison. Mm. And that means that the environment in prison is, to is tougher. 
we've also had some gang conflicts and our gang environment has become extremely volatile and shifting. And that means that uh, before you'd in a, uh, an ordinary ward like the one that you saw in, um, in R, mm. in a ward like that you could just walk in and out of each other's uh, cells. And that's not possible anymore. People are use, spending a lot of time on the cells mm. uh, and only maybe having restricted uh, common time with somebody else, yeah. with one uh, other person. So, so it's, the prisons today are fundamentally different from what they were uh, 10 or 20 years ago. We want to thank you again for listening to OSM's pilot episode, The Warden's Daughter. Please check out our intro episode discussing future plans for OSM and how we plan to continue sharing stories with you on global social justice and awareness. In our next episode, we speak with a Danish college student excited to begin his first semester at one of the best universities around. He faces three challenges though, COVID-19, navigating online classes, and completing a 14 year sentence at a Danish correctional institution. We'll see you next time here at Our Small Majority.